Today we're going to see how much further we can push Intel's 10900K with CPU, memory and cache overclocking. Out of the box this is the fastest CPU in terms of single core performance that you can buy right now and our brief look at overclocking in the initial review showed that you can get all 10 cores to 5.2 gigahertz with some pretty average voltages. 5.3 should also be doable on most of the 10900Ks out there in the wild but you most likely will run into thermal limitations and instability running AVX workloads, but we will be talking about all of that today. We're also going to see what effect memory overclocking has on performance here and see just how far we can push this 4000 megahertz CL15 kit from G-Skill. Now, although the 10900K is fast enough out of the box, there is some room left in the tank for all core overclocking. It's also clear that Intel reserved the best of their silicon for these i9s, considering what frequencies they can hit. That makes these quite a bit of fun and quite interesting to overclock as they can be pushed pretty far. And in some workloads that will provide a significant boost in performance. In some multi-threaded workloads, you will be able to close that gap between the 10900K and 3900X, although at substantial more power. But before you start cranking up the voltages and CPU clock speed, there are a couple of limits that you do need to remove in the motherboard's BIOS. On some Z490 motherboards, a long duration power limit of 125 watts will be set by default as this is technically the power specification of the 10900K and this is the main setting that you'll want to look out for. By just removing this limit and setting it to something virtually unlimited, the 10900K's sustained all-core boost clock will now be increased from around 4.2 gigahertz all the way up to 4.9. This significantly improves performance in multi-threaded workloads like rendering, but don't expect much when it comes to gaming. Personally though, I don't really consider this overclocking, although some may, because you are technically going out of Intel spec and you know overclocking the long duration of the CPU, but I don't consider it overclocking because probably about half of the Z490 motherboards out there will run the 10900K unlimited anyway. For example, two of the three ATX boards that I've got here will run the 10900K with an unlimited long duration power limit. And that means that it will hit that 4.9 gigahertz boost clock over sustained durations. One setting isn't wrong or right though. And as we saw, this limit is very easy to remove if you do end up with a Z490 board with that power limit enforced. The ASUS Z490 Maximus 12 Hero is actually what we're going to be using for overclocking today. And it does have that 125 watt limit enforced. And I'll also be pairing that with a 360 mil NZXT Kraken X73 cooler to try and avoid as much thermal limitations as we can here. I also have on hand an ultra high speed memory kit from G-Skill, 16 gigabytes rated at 4,000 megahertz with incredibly tight timings. Surprisingly, I was able to squeeze a bit more out of this kit as well. So now let's take a look at the CPU core overclock settings that I've got here for the Maximus 12 Hero. And it's important to note here that we're really just going with the basics. We're going for an all core CPU overclock, overclocking all 10 cores to the same frequency. If you wanna get a bit more creative, you can disable hyper-threading on some of those fastest cores to maybe push those a bit further. And you can also set custom voltage frequency curves. However, the performance benefits of doing either of those two things may not kind of be worth it for the amount of time that it would take to properly set those settings. So I really do recommend just sticking with the basics if you just kind of want the best performance that you can get out of this CPU without wasting too much time with testing and validation. So the first few settings that you'll want to set in the BIOS are the power restriction settings that I mentioned earlier. Make sure those are set to max. And of course, you want to double check that your XMP profile is enabled for your specific memory kit. Now there are a couple of different voltage settings that you can use here. Manual will set a static voltage. Offset will simply add a positive or negative offset to the stock value and adaptive will set a target voltage that the processor will boost to when it's under load. I'd recommend doing your actual testing and finding your stable overclock with a manual static voltage as that way you don't need to worry about the deviations that you'll come across when using offset or adaptive. But then when you're comfortable with a stable clock speed and voltage value, I'd recommend switching to either adaptive or offset for daily use. 
You'll also want to adjust the LLC or load line calibration setting. This is how much drop there is between the voltage that you set in the BIOS and what the CPU actually uses when at load. Typically, you'll want the least amount of deviation that you can get, and it's going to be different for each of the motherboards out there. Here on the Maximus 12 Hero, I'd recommend LLC level four for modes adaptive and offset, and then level eight if you plan on using a manual voltage. Now, one of the biggest questions that you'll see when it comes to overclocking is the kind of debate of what is a safe daily voltage to be using. And although there are lots of different opinions here, at least for Intel's 14 nanometer, I'd say that 1.35 volts is a good kind of rule of thumb. Certainly you could go up to like 1.4 if you wanna get a high score and a benchmark, but I think 1.35 volts, a load voltage of 1.35 volts is kind of a good rule of thumb to be sticking with. It's also important to note that 1.35 volts or any voltage value for that matter may mean kind of different things across a range of motherboards. So that's kind of why it's better to go with a conservative value in my opinion, because you never know for sure if you're actually getting something a little bit higher on a specific board. So ideally I'd like to keep things between 1.3 and 1.35. This is also the voltage range where you start getting increasingly minimal returns in regards to clock speed. In other words, much higher power consumption and thermals for a minimal trade-off in performance. Most of your overclocking gains are going to be in the 1.2 to 1.3 volts range. Conveniently enough, once you start surpassing 1.3 volts on a 10900K, that's when you start kind of being restricted in terms of thermals anyway, before you kind of even have the chance to ask the question, what is a safe voltage? So I have two 10900Ks on hand here, and one is slightly better than the other. With these settings, one needed just 1.225 volts at 5.2 gigahertz, whereas the other one needed 1.26 volts. Note those are the voltage values at load. Processor one was also kind of stable at 5.3 in everything except for Blender, which is an AVX workload, whereas the second 10900K couldn't hit 5.3 without thermal and voltage limitations. So if you end up with a processor on hand that's more like the first sample, you're advised to set an AVX offset of minus one, meaning it'll now run at 5.2 in those AVX workloads as opposed to 5.3 and then potentially crashing. So at 5.3 gigahertz, we see around a 6.5% gain in performance over a stock 10900K with unlimited power, and in V-Ray we see a little over 5%. When it comes to gaming, some CPU intensive titles will see quite a bit gained. For example, in Far Cry 5 we see almost an 8% gain, whereas in Rainbow Six Siege the gains are closer to around 3%. I'll also note that there are serious thermal limitations here when running the 10900K at close to 1.35 volts in heavy workloads. Realistically, most of you are going to be held back at as little as 1.3 volts. The power consumption here is also a bit amusing, over 330 watts while rendering in Cinebench. That is absolutely massive. For daily use, I'd definitely be opting for the lower power and thermals at say 5.2 or 5.1 gigahertz for the trade-off of just a couple hundred megahertz. So those gains are already quite a bit above stock, but if you've got a bit more time and enthusiasm on your hands, memory overclocking is something that can stretch things a bit further. Keep in mind there are a lot more variables to consider here if you want to get things perfect, but here's a quick 30 second run through of how I squeezed a bit more performance out of the 4000 megahertz kit that I've got here. The first step that I would usually do would be to bump up the voltage to around 1.45 volts, but funnily enough, this kit runs at 1.5 volts out of the box, so I left that unchanged. Then you can either tighten the memory timings or bump up the clock frequency. In our case, I was able to bump up the clock speed to 4133 megahertz while keeping the same timings as stock. Personally, I was hoping for a bit more when it came to the gains here. Certainly there are going to be substantial gains in some applications and games, but at least in Cinebench, V-Ray and Far Cry 5, there wasn't an overwhelmingly huge benefit from an overclocked high-speed memory kit. Surely not enough to get me to spend an additional 100 to $150. For reference, the rest of the values here are using a 3200 MHz CL14 kit, and I would consider that to be fast enough and of course a better value. For sure though, it is fun to play around with a very high speed memory kit like this and to kind of break records in a sense of what we couldn't do previously. CPU cache overclocking is the last part that you'll want to do just by increasing the multiplier in the BIOS. At the very least, some say that this is a good rule of thumb to overclock this just to keep it a few few hundred megahertz of your CPU clock. In our case, I was able to increase it from 4.3 to 4.8 without any issues. 
This gave us some easily 30 points in Cinebench and about a 2% gain in V-Ray, but also just beating a Ryzen 3900X. So overall, we're left with around an 8.5% gain in Cinebench over a stock 10900K without any power limits, and around 20% over a 10900K running at 125 watts. For most users, the question is, is this going to be worth it? And personally, I think that pushing the limits this far is only going to be really worth it for testing and validation purposes and to see what your own hardware is capable of. But for daily use, I definitely recommend dialing things back one or two notches, if not for the purpose of application and gaming stability, but at least to take a step back from the power and thermal inefficiency, at least for the CPU. Same goes for the memory overclocking. Somewhere between your XMP profile and the max speed of what the kit is capable of, that's what I'd recommend for daily use. And of course, you can use this approach to overclocking the 10600K and 10700K as well. You just need to manage your expectations because those are lower binned processes. They won't probably be able to hit 5.3. So as always, a huge thanks for watching and I will see you all in the next one.